Welcome to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. <laughs> Dell challenges the status quo, questions everything, and empowers you to return to your core beliefs to make your life better. If you're ready to hear the truth and get your roadmap to the lifestyle you really want, the next hour will change your life. And now your host, self-made millionaire, national award-winning investor of the year, CEO and founder of Lifestyles Unlimited, Del Wamsley. Welcome to Del Wamsley Radio Show, where the hype ends and the help begins. I'm your host, Del Wamsley, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. With me here today to uh, help work through some issues is uh, Mr. Don Rao from Dallas, Texas, one of our multifamily mentors. Don, welcome to the show. Hey, Dell. Thanks. Great to be here. You know, um, we were talking the other day, and you brought up a topic I thought was pretty interesting, maybe worth doing a radio show on, and that was your discussion uh, that you were bringing up about how you see the normal business model completely different than the real estate business model. And then you went further and even explained that it wasn't just the real estate model. It was the lifestyle's real estate model is completely different than the normal business model. And I think that you're right on that to the extent that even the people that do real estate do it the old-fashioned business model. And that's why 9 out of 10 businesses fail within the first five years of business. Um, if it's possible... Where would you like to pick that conversation up at? Because I thought it was an interesting conversation when you were pre- presenting it before. Well, I was just—I guess we could we could build out the framework of a traditional small business um, tends to be kind of the same mo over and over. I see people that are small business owners and they're real proud of their accomplishments, and, and they should be. But but we have to understand we're we're just pretty much buying a job, right? I know when I was doing it, instead of having one boss, I had over a hundred bosses that were called customers. And uh, you know that model is is typically on a small business. The owner uh, is heavily involved in running the day to day operations, which is totally different than what we do here at Lifestyles. Yeah, your statement of it being a turnkey business that was interesting. Explain that one to people. <laughs> Yeah, I call it, I call it small business like that where it's owner operator, mom and pop. I call it a turnkey business, and the reason for that is typically if they're not there to turn the key, there is no business. So it's it's you know get up, go to work, unlock the door, get the cash register open, money in the drawer, ready for business that day. And uh, of course, we don't we don't do it that way in the apartment business, particularly the way we do it here at Lifestyles. I know that some people that own multifamily because, uh, you know, we end up buying these properties from them uh, uh, quite a bit. And their operation is usually, you know, they're recording all of their activity. If you're lucky, it's on a spreadsheet. If you're not lucky, it's in a shoebox. So, uh, you know, we, we've gotten away from that. And uh, we run it actually like a business. And we don't participate in the day-to-day. I'm not I'm not on property picking up trash or showing people units uh, to rent. Uh, that's just not the way we do it. And um, night and day difference in the lifestyle's way of doing multifamily and the traditional small business owner. You know, it's, you brought up a point I thought was reminding me of something. Back up on um, two apartment complexes from one guy who's about 70 years old, and he was just getting to the point where it's too much for him to operate anymore, and his son wanted nothing to do with it because the way his dad did it. The way he worked, it was just a disastrous problem. The son wanted no part of it. So he had to get rid of the properties because his son, when he thought was going to inherit them and take them over, wouldn't do it. And uh, I talked to the guy for months about buying the place, and he would never give me his financials. And finally, I just got mad at him. I said, look, either you're going to give me the financials so I can get a loan on this place or you're not. So he pulls out a little spiral notebook, the kind that would fit in your, you know, your upper pocket of a shirt, And he handed it to me. And I said, what is this? He goes, that's my financials. And I opened it up, and all he had in this book was how much money had been collected. Each page was, okay, we got 10000 in the bank on Monday, you know, the first, and we got, you know, 5000 in the bank Tuesday the second, right down the line for the whole month, and that was his total collections for the month. He had no expenses, no bills, no nothing. And uh, 
I said, this is financials. He goes, that's all you need. And I said, what do you mean that's all I need? He said, well, you know, if, if you buy this property, are you going to keep my staff? I said, probably not. So he says, you're probably going to figure out what your own payroll is. He goes, if you buy this property from me, you're going to say pay the same property taxes I pay, or are they going to change when you have a higher sales price? And I said, well, it's probably going to change. He said, well, about insurance, are you going to take my insurance, or are you going to go get your own insurance? You can't keep mine. And he goes, yeah, I'm going to get my own insurance, so you're going to know what that's going to be. He said, pretty much every expense you're going to have, you're going to create. And it's going to be up to you what you want them to be. So there's really no need to know what mine are. And, you know, I sat there, Don, for a second, dumbfounded. And then I realized it. It really is true. The, the only thing that's really important is how much money can the property bring in. Uh, and then everything else can be calculated from beyond that. But the point was, he never did financials. I don't even know how he does his taxes. You know, he probably lied on him. But you're right. These people out there running these businesses with absolutely no business acumen at all. Uh, just tremendous. Uh, uh, most of them are working long hours, too, wouldn't you agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I was uh, kind of doing a little research on this after we had we had talked about it initially. And, uh, you know, most, most business owners typically work way more hours than their employees. They... Uh, again, it's that back to buying a job. It's really where where they've landed. Um, you know, they're so involved in the business, and they, they get that do-it-yourself mentality. I know I had it before coming to Lifestyles. I had a pickup, and man, I knew where everything was at Home Depot and Lowe's, and I would go in there, get the stuff in the morning, and haul it out to the property. And and uh, one day I woke up and kind of realized that. I could accomplish way more by uh, writing checks and giving them scopes of work and letting them do it than I possibly could running around trying to trying to save a few, few bucks here and there and then and then not getting the best results on whatever project it was I was I was working on. It's much better left to the, the hands of the professionals. They have all the tools. Uh, you know, I usually meet them at the property and uh, review what they're going to do for that day. And then I leave and I come back at the end of the day and see what kind of progress they've made. And I figured I could I could do four or five projects like that versus tying up my time just overseeing one. Yeah, well, I can I can relate to that. When I first started, I remember, you know, doing my own make readies in my houses when I first started. And it is, it's the natural concept that the only way you've ever been able to make money in your life is through a job. The only way you've been able to keep money was to not spend it. And you get to the point where when you come out of corporate America, you come out of a job environment, even if it's not corporate America, the only thing you've ever had control of in your life are your expenses. So to you, if I do it, not only do you have that belief that, I'm the only one that can do it right, which is a very prevalent belief out there. You know, if it's going to be, it's up to me type of thing. Uh, but also, right. you're thinking that a penny saved is a penny earned. I mean, you think of all the things you've been taught your whole life about frugality. And when you get into business, that's the first thing you want to do is you start with frugality. And it's, it's really the death nail in the coffin uh, of most businesses. The other thing I notice... Um, and you had mentioned when we were discussing this, I know to be very true. Uh, not only do they have the do-it-yourself mentality that I can do it, and I can save the money to do it, but I've noticed that beginners buy the worst properties out there. And I guess, there's, you know, I, I can think of one or two or three reasons why that might be, but I see it to be true. When people first start, they buy the cheapest thing they can buy, you know. Hey man, I gotta I gotta buy something I can afford, and so they buy stuff that's really in bad condition. They don't realize how bad the condition is, and then they don't go in there with a plan to do the renovations up front. And they just sort of kind of waddle through this mess of stuff that keeps going wrong over and over and over again. Um, never thinking from the beginning that boy I should bring some money in to fix all this stuff. Talk about under capitalization how devastating that is to a startup business yeah yeah that can that can be uh, not so much for the real estate at least not the way we do it but yeah very very much so in, in a uh, small business uh, whatever you're doing making cupcakes or uh, cleaning people's office buildings like I was 
you um, tend to just focus on the amount of money you need to get, you know, to get the door open, to get your shelf stocked. Uh, beyond that, there's not much of a – it's all reactionary pretty much beyond that point. Oh, we're short this month. We've, we've got a truck coming in. How are we going to pay for this? That's, that's the way it happens. And, and it's just you, you can't do everything. But but that's the mentality of most small business owners is that they're the most important guy on the organization chart. They've got to be there every day. Nobody can do it as well as them, you know, that and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's, that's something that's uh, very difficult to overcome. All right, I think we'll take a break right there. We'll be right back with Don Rowell and the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Listening to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell will be right back with more life changing principles in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time. Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to Dell Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today is Don Rao, a mentor out of the Dallas area. He's one of our national mentors for multifamily. And Don has a discussion that he's put together for us today about the difference between running your property like a small mom and pop business person and uh, or a more traditional method of doing it compared to the way we do it here at Lifestyles, which makes it completely different. Uh, Don, where do you want to pick that back up at? Um, you know, do, do you think small business people put a lot of time into planning? Oh, I, it's not that they don't put time into planning. It's the time frame that they plan for. Uh, you know, usually it's seat of the pants, uh, month to month kind of kind of planning. Uh, there's there's not typically a, a longer term plan in place, and I, again, I think that's just because they get bogged down and in, in making sure that you know the business is open and functioning, and they're right in the middle of of the operation. Um, yeah, the lifestyles is is totally different. I we we're talking about the even in real estate, kind of get away from just the small business owner, uh, but even in real estate, we see owners that come in and. I know we had a property in contract here a while back, and it was well, about 30 units. Uh, and what appeared to be, you know, the guy owned several properties. And so I thought he would be, you know, fairly sophisticated. So we go we go to start submitting financials for the lender, and um, he, he doesn't have anything. And, and he sends me a spreadsheet, and it's his rent roll. And I said, well, do you have, um, you know, what about the month before? And what this guy was doing is he was taking an Excel spreadsheet, and every month he would just he would go in there and he would change it. Instead of saving the month before, he'd just clear all the data and enter in that month. So he had no no record of what he had done the, the previous year. But, uh, you know, that, that tends to be p- typical. But when we take them over, we set them up like a business. We have a, uh, a budget that goes on at least for the first year. Uh, we're well capitalized. We we make sure that everything's in place to be successful, and uh, and we are. So as you as you work through this with people, do you ever have anybody? You know, you've been mentoring for quite a while now. If you ever run into somebody who won't listen, won't make changes, won't come over to our side, our way of thinking. There's a few, but uh, I think we've done such a good job of educating them before they get to that point that it's not near what it used to be. They, they have the expectation uh, that, that more um, correlates with, with the, the, uh, the education material. So it's, it's not as, as big of a problem at all. We, we're finding that uh, this new education platform that, that came out last year is really, really helping everyone to go at it with the right mindset. And uh, you know that usually translates to uh, more success. You know, yesterday I uh, took on an article about a guy who was saying that uh, stocks are better than real estate. And the guy who sent me the article after hearing me do the radio show sent me another email saying that, you know, I've been talking to this guy. I've been emailing back and forth with him and trying to get him to, you know, understand that he doesn't know what he's talking about. And... 
which I didn't know when I did the radio show about him. I think you might have heard that radio show yesterday, stimulated the conversation yeah, today. Yeah. But uh, when a guy sent me his email, I said, can you send me those emails? It was really interesting to see that this guy didn't understand about depreciation. Didn't what you know? He thought he didn't even know that you could depreciate your real estate. He owned a property free and clear, so he had no. He had to pay the property taxes. He had to pay income taxes, and he lived in California, so he had not only federal income tax but state income taxes <laughs> on the income. And and he had no depreciation and no mortgage, so he was just getting killed by this property that in California, I'm sure. You know, probably rents for three or four thousand bucks a month, and he was getting all that money and paying tax on. He hated. He thought it was terrible. But the guy had no idea about depreciation. He had no idea about the fact you could refinance the money out and and put a mortgage on there and lower your your tax basis. It just it was an amazing amazing email to see. And yet this guy's writing articles on finances. And what was interesting is that the member who was writing to this guy was telling him all this stuff. And the guy was like dumbfounded. You, you, what? How, how? You know, it's just amazing. So, how many people do you think, not our members, but other people going to business, Don, don't have any idea what they're doing? I mean, zip. Uh, in real estate or just in business in general? General small I, businesses? Yeah, I think, I think a lot businesses. of them. A lot of them don't have any idea. You know, it tends to be a trade that they, they, they've somehow mastered or, or perfected, and then they think they can go out and do it on their own, which they probably can. But there's more to, to, uh, to, to running a business than there is to having a job, and that, that job mentality tends to follow them over into the small business arena. Um, and, you know, you can be the greatest plumber in the world, but you can't keep your books and meet payroll and handle your taxes, um, you're, you're, you can be sunk pretty fast. I, I know there's uh, probably a journal in, in Houston, but the Dallas Business Journal, in the back of it, it lists all of the uh, the tax obligations that are unpaid. And, and far and away, most of those are the uh, payroll taxes. You know, the, the, the employer pays, the, pays his help and then End of the month, he doesn't have money to pay his FICA and his Medicare on the on the wages he's paid. So, I think that's pretty typical. And um, of course, what we teach is is uh, avoids all of those haphazards of, of the small business. You know, that's true. the The number one IRS lawsuit out there is for payroll taxes. Believe it or not, that's that's mm-hmm. the number one thing that takes businesses down. They they don't realize they have to pay those quarterly estimated income taxes and payroll taxes every month that they put out of payroll. So it's a bizarre situation. Um, a person that does my lawn care and uh, the lady that runs the lawn care business had bought it from the guy who owned it before. She was kind of like his office manager type of thing. And uh, she she bought this business from the guy, not understanding that she was going to have to pay him to buy the business. So she was facilitating an owner finance agreement where he still owned everything until she paid it all off. And if she didn't pay it all off, uh, he was going to take it back from her. Uh, she paid three or four times what the asset was worth because all she really bought was a bunch of old junky equipment that were paid in full in his, you know, from him. But she had mm-hmm. to buy that equipment from him along with buy his business from him. Uh, and so she had a basis uh, to start with out of the blocks of losing money. And she lost money for a year on this business before I sat down with her and talked to her about it. And said, you know, you have to understand what you're doing here. You know, you need to just break this deal off. I said, give me your contract. I'll read your contract with you. And I read it. And, you know, I could see that it was the contract was so misrepresented that it was easy for her to get out of the deal. Um, but she didn't understand that she was losing money for a year thinking She's buying a business when all she really bought was a book of work. In other words, here's 20 yards we're taking care of. Um, you're buying that plus all my old junky equipment. And I think a lot of people, you know, have no idea, zero zip idea how to run a business when they first get into it. We'll take a short break. Be right back with the Del Wamsley Radio Show. 
You're listening to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. Dell will be right back with more life changing principles in just a few minutes. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America one person at a time. Dell Wamsley. Welcome back to the Dell Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today is Don Rao out of Dallas. And Don, you know, as we're sitting here talking about these small businesses, the traditional business model, um, you have to also think about the information process uh, on small business. You know, in our, our group here, everybody shares everything. So that if you need to know how to do something, you need to know where to find something, You've got it at your fingertips, you know, pretty much 24-7 on almost, no, I would say everything. There's nothing that's, that is held back from people to know. Uh, that's not the way it is with most small businesses, is it? I mean, most small businesses protect their information and hence don't get anybody else's information. Explain how, the, how that works. Uh, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, nobody, nobody wants to... Uh you know, what, whatever they're selling, they don't want to tell you what their, their basis is in it, that how much it costs them, what their markups are. They don't want to tell you what their sales figures are for the year. Sources of uh, materials, uh, usually that's guarded. One, the one that I like, though, is the secret sauce. You know, how many times you see these recipes where, you know, we've got this secret thing, you know, that we can't share with anyone. And I always, uh, kind of my own little Donism, I guess, always say, you know, that we, we kind of admit that it's just Thousand Island dressing. It. We just set out to make the best we can. There's, there's really no secrets. And within lifestyles, there's such a sharing of information that it's, um, there's very few uh, obstacles that you'll come across in, in, in uh, real estate that, you can't sit in a room with with members and find someone in that group has dealt with that problem before. And I and I've said the thing about lifestyles, and again, I'm coming from a small business, family owned, family owned business background. Lifestyles to me was like entering a family business that was in its fifth or sixth generation. You know, that's that's the power that uh, that lifestyles brings to to the operation and. You know, the acquisition, disposition, everything that goes on in real estate, uh, we have members that have been through those things many, many times over. So it, it's funny that, you know, you get you get several owners in a room, and it turns into a competition, what they have done, and they're all trying to one-up one another. And, and out of that comes some, some really creative ways of handling uh, problems that we face on day-to-day. So you go through this and you're processing this as a mentor with someone. How do you get it across to them that they need to be open and sharing about everything? Is, it, is that all picked up from the radio show and from the two-day and the, all the initial processes? Are they pretty open by the time they get to you? Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're, uh, it's just the culture of, within the group. The, the, one of the number one things that I hear new members say, you know, somebody that's joined, they've been in a couple of months, they're just, you know, getting oriented with events and, and how the schedule flows, is that how open everyone is. You know, who, who would walk into a room and, you know, we, we do these road trips and, and those are really fun. And at the end of the day, we sit down, we have lunch together, maybe a couple of adult, adult beverages, but just the sharing of information. But they will, they kind of grasp that from being a new member. So it's not foreign by the time they they get to the point where they're talking to one of us. It's, uh, you know, they're already, they already have the amazement of, wow, I can't believe this. You know, I have friends that I've known all my life, and I don't know their net worth, and here this guy sitting across from me at lunch has already told me, you know, his net worth, his liquidity, you know, we're talking about doing deals together in the future. That, that's just the dynamics that the, the group brings. It's very exciting. So that adds uh, one more aspect to, to this whole equation. That is the ability to expand. I have a friend that owns a restaurant, and it's one of my favorite restaurants. I go there quite regularly. And every time I go there, the owner and his wife are there. One of the two or both of them are there, and they're kids. And, you know, I've sat down with them many times and said, look, your restaurant is incredible. So there's incredible food. We live way out in the middle of nowhere, uh, an area that's growing rapidly. There's not very many good restaurants you can go to. And every one we do go to are completely packed because there's not very many of them. So why, won't, why don't you expand? We'll, we'll even put up the money for you to expand if you'll expand your business. We'll go in as partners. I'll put up the money. You do the thing. And he looked at me and says, no, no. 
now we're, we're looking to get out of business um, we're tired we work 60 80 hours a week we thought the kids would grow up and be able to take over the business for us but the kids you know the you know the apple may not fall far from the tree but it sure can roll a long distance in this day and age they have different ideas they don't want to work that hard or that long and uh, the opportunity for these people to expand is just would be incredible. I mean, that an incredibly good product that everybody ever take there just raves on the place. But there they are. They have no ability to expand because they can't expand themselves. Whereas, you know, my gosh, how many apartment complexes do people own? What would you say of the lead investors, Don? And you can make up a number. We're not going to hold you to any number. But... The lead investors, a first-time guy owns one apartment complex. You look all the way to Curtis, and Curtis has 40 apartment complexes. What do you think the average is amongst the lead investors? Uh, you know, would it be two, three, five? What would you say the, the average number of businesses owned is by these different lead investors? I would say uh, average is... is you know, hard to tell, but I, I would say somewhere between three and five on average per per lead. I know that, uh, particularly if you're self-managing, that that five is kind of the the point where it all starts coming together, making sense, and you get some economies of scale in, in all aspects of the operation. But I'd say three to five, and that's usually so you, just a self-limit. You know, they just limit themselves to that, but for whatever reason. You could do well, the more. Reason is that they don't want to, they don't want to scale up. That. Yeah, they don't want to scale up to the next level, and, and that's what it really takes. You have to scale up either by producing a larger management company with more integral intric parts, uh, or you have to go to completely another management company to where you're not a part of any of the. Uh, business activity other than the asset management part of it. And some people don't want to do that because they don't want to let go of the control of having the ownership of the management company. And some people don't want to, don't want to do it because they don't want to scale up their own management company. And let's face it, by the time you own three to five apartment complexes, you're making probably 10 grand a month from each property. You're probably making 30 to 50 grand a month. And that pretty much satiates most people. So but the point I'm getting mm -hmm. to is the opportunity to grow here in, in this business the way we do it is much greater than you go out there and you own one electrical company. You're not going to set up another electrical company. You, know, you may not even want to build, expand the book of business. No. You know what I mean? It's just too much work right. on this. So um, let's see if we're going to change topics. We've got, oh, we got three minutes left on this segment here. And then we got one more segment left. I wanted to see if there's anything else you wanted to talk about because you've been busy, you haven't been on in a long time. Is there any other things that are coming up lately that really have captured your attention? Anytime we can get out on property with uh, members outside of our home offices, mm -hmm. we've had a lot of out of state, had a lot of out of state uh, members. We exchange emails a lot, give you know, giving us uh, input, you know, ideas. It's really great. I, I love it. We're going to take a short break here in a second, Don. Let me go ahead and see uh, what we've got here. As far as te we've got a telephone number here. If people want to call in right now and ask Don a question, and, uh, you know, if you've got any questions about the difference between the way we do business and the way somebody else does business, uh, those questions would be, uh, we'll be able to take those at the next segment here. So we're going to go out now with uh, the, the traditional rules of small business. No trade secrets allowed. Sales figures guarded. Suppliers aren't revealed. And profits and earnings not shared, which means reverse. You don't get any of that information from anybody else. And so you have no way to grow other than to learn from your mistakes. Now, from the files of Del Wamsley. I think the 401k is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my entire life. And eh, maybe not the stupidest, but it's got flaws. And the way they look at it is, what they're going to do is eliminate the current year tax deduction on money contributed to the 401k and or matching dollars contributed to the 401k. So before, your company would get a tax deduction for what they contributed to you, you'd get a tax deduction for what you contributed. Now, those contributions go away. Billions and billions of dollars of extra taxes for them. Instead, what they're going to do is they're going to give the employee who contributed 
a 26% tax credit. So instead of getting a 42% tax write-off, they're going to get a 26% tax credit that will go into the 401k. So think about it. You took $10,000 out of your pocket this year to put in a 401k because that's been told the right thing to do. You used to get a $10,000 deduction on your taxes. Now you won't. Now you're going to pay the taxes on $10,000, which will be anywhere from $1,500 to to $4,200, depending on which tax bracket you're in. And you're going to pay those taxes, but you're paying it on money you didn't get. You're also paying Social Security and Medicare on that money, whether you realize it or not, that's even happening today. So now you're paying, let's say you're in the 37% tax bracket and you're paying half of Social Security and Medicare, that's another 7.5%. You are saving $10,000 and paying $5,600 on that $10,000 to save it and not getting it. Can't touch it. Think about that. We'll take a short break. Be right back with Don Rao and the Del Wamsley Radio Show. Welcome back. Now, here's some more unconventional wisdom to set you free from the man on a mission to retire America, one person at a time, Del Wamsley. Welcome back to the last segment of the Del Wamsley Radio Show. With me here today is Don Rao, a multifamily mentor out of the Dallas market. Don, I'm going to take a different direction here for the last segment, and I'm going to bring up some information that I brought up in the show a couple days ago, which is um, population growth. Um, I don't know what you guys are doing in Dallas, whatever it is, you know, if you're giving away free money or, you know, free drugs or something. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to these numbers, Don. Dallas, Fort Worth, change in population, 146,238 new population, new people. Now, The next closest one to that is Houston at 94,000, which is 50,000 less. Then Atlanta at 89, which is 50,000 less. Then Phoenix at 88. And then from there, it drops down into the 60s for Washington and Seattle, into the 50s, and then into the 40s, the 30s, the 20s. In other words, there's only four cities in the country that are anywhere near 90 or above, right? Only four one of them's Houston, one of them's Atlanta, one of them's Phoenix, but only one. <laughs> That's 150,000 people. That's yeah, a 50% amazing. increase from anybody else, even the best other four cities. What are you doing up there, Don? Absolutely. I uh, wish I could take credit for it, but actually it's just job creation. we got uh, just a lot of jobs coming in. We've got some things that are still pending that Dallas uh, Fort Worth hasn't been awarded on yet. There's some big distribution centers that are that are coming into play. And uh well, it's just a really exciting time up here. It's it's amazing how uh, how fast things are growing. Where are you housing all those people, Don? Do you have well, I don't lots know. of I, expansion I tell you or? one thing that really put this into perspective, uh you know, JB Durham has a has a way with numbers as we all know. And he told me, I guess it was a couple years ago now, when they were projecting that this was going to happen to the DFW area, he said, think about it this way. If if we were to take the uh, take Oklahoma City and just shutter the whole town and move everyone to DFW in three years, that's the impact it's going to have. And, boy, that was a, that was a really good visual. Uh, you know, numbers – Numbers have their own meaning, but boy, having having something like that as a to, to model it out and and put it in perspective that that's huge. What kind of um, increases in rents are you seeing up there, Don? And what kind of occupancies are you seeing up there? Well, occupancy across the board, uh, definitely above ninety five percent. I know our properties are are running. Uh, I'm in Denton. And we're running 98 to 100. And I know the rules. You know, if you're if you're running that high, you need to be bumping the rents. But you know, it's it, the rents are moving so fast that when somebody who signed a, a lease a year ago, they they may have skipped over like two rent increases. It's it's moving that fast. So uh, yeah, it's a challenge. But uh, you know, so there, when you when you run problems. into that situation, this is a good one. When a lease has outlived two rent increases, when they come to that lease renewal, do you bump them both rent increases, or do you just do a partial one and do a nuisance increase? How do you deal with that? It, a lot of it just depends on, you know, um, 
the unit condition. If uh, if we can get them out of there and maybe go in there and spruce things up and update the interiors and, and get hundred hundred fifty uh, dollar bump in rent, we'll we'll do that. But you know, good residents have been in place uh, for a while and they don't cause problems. They pay their rent on time. Uh, we, we like to keep them in place, and we'll make every effort to, uh, you know, keep it within their budget. But at some point, you know, it just comes down to a business decision. But um, so far, so good. It's a, it's a great market. Uh, just loving it. As a, um, a general rule, if you can, share with us about how many different apartment projects are going on at the same time in the Dallas Fort Worth area of by Lifestyles members. In other words, where you're in the process of either looking at them, our letter of intent on them, contract on them, yeah. due diligence, closing, yeah. whatever. Yeah. What what kind of volume? Yeah, staggering. Uh, we yeah, we had uh, our I think my weekly update that came through. Now I'm not directly referring to Charles Ho who's who's here also, but we divide the workload and I think collectively we had just under twenty properties that were letter of intent or actually in contract it's it's been the busiest that i've seen it since i've been on since i've been on staff and or even been a lifestyle member as far as that goes uh just uh deal flow is just incredible and uh i think i've, I've had uh two due diligence this week so uh there's a lot of activity a lot of a lot of first-time buyers too that uh, that really need some coaching and Somebody to hold their hand, get them through the process. Um, yeah, it's just real exciting uh, to see. You know, we, we forget what uh, what we know until we're asked certain questions. I'm like, yeah, I forgot that I knew that. You know, but you know, I helped a guy the other day save about fifty thousand uh, dollars going at a going at a rehab uh, item in a different way, and uh, that, that's real energizing. You know, real yeah, fun yeah, stuff. Thinking. Just off the top of my head, I was thinking, you know, we don't, I don't know the number, but let's say the average number of people in one of these syndicated deals is 25 people. And if you have 20 deals going on at any one time, which Houston, we're running average about 25 deals at a time. So you take 20 deals times 25, that's 500 people that are getting into a deal at this time. That's just an amazing right. number. And that's just Dallas. So if you talk about Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin, you talk about three times as much. That's fifteen hundred people that you are going to within the next wow. forty-five to ninety days impact their lives. Uh, just a tremendous number. Something we should all be proud of. Don, I want to thank you for coming on today. Appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man out there with your life and your wife and all the mentoring you're doing. So have a wonderful day. And the rest of you out there, remember this: it's not the money, it's the lifestyle. Have a wonderful day. Information and opinions you hear on the Del Wamsley Radio Show are those of the host, Del Wamsley, his guests, and his callers, and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of this station, its affiliates, its management, or advertisers. The Del Wamsley Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Del Wamsley Show constitutes an endorsement, recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.